Everybody knew that Chris was going to be a star. I mean, he had an enormously powerful aura about him. The only person in the world who could play Superman is Chris. He was a movie star overnight, I mean, around the world. I mean, it was absolutely a freak accident. He said, I'm going to play these cards. And watch me, I'm going to play them really good. By the time Christopher Reeve was 26, he had reached a plateau of success many actors can only dream of. He achieved international stardom portraying the legendary Man of Steel, Superman. He made his first Broadway appearance, starring opposite Katharine Hepburn. We all went up and met with Katharine Hepburn for this play she was doing, and Chris walked in. Got it immediately, damn him. He really had a real light around him. At the same time Chris was acting on Broadway, he was also wowing the women of America as a soap star on the telly. I guess you can never forgive me for what I did to you. Over the years, he played almost 150 theatrical roles and made 10 television films. And he appeared in highly regarded movies like The Bostonians, Death Trap, and The Remains of the Day. By 1995, Chris Reeve had everything he could possibly want including a beautiful wife and three wonderful children. But the life he loved changed completely in 1995. During a riding competition in Culpeper, Virginia, Chris was thrown from his horse and broke his neck. It was absolutely a freak accident. If I'd landed a little bit one way, I'd be dead. A little bit more the other way, I would have walked away from it. Christopher had the most severe injury at the highest level possible. He had what is called a complete spinal cord injury where the spinal cord exits the brain. Once I got past the regret, there was time to say, okay, here's the hand you've been dealt. Now what are we, what are we gonna do with it? Hi everybody, how you doing? What Chris has done with it is extraordinary. He put a face to spinal cord injury for the first time for the American public. And he showed such courage when he did that, that you know, everybody's hearts opened up to him. He gave something to the victims of spinal cord injuries that they never had before. He said the first thing was hope. Everything else followed. Nurturing the hope required money, and by 2004, Chris's foundation had raised $47 million to fund groundbreaking research to find a cure. I think he has inspired a generation of scientists to work very, very hard. And we're closer to getting therapies for people than ever, ever before. For Chris and his wife, Dana, it's not only about cure, it's also about care. Their foundation provides quality of life grants that help people who are paralyzed. Whether it's brain trauma or stroke or MS or ALS, you know, we, we cover anything to do with paralysis. Uh, so it's not just spinal cord injury. That affects 8 million Americans. What's wonderful is that Chris is strong enough to be able to rise above a really tragic situation and is able to find the good and, and carry on. Christopher Reeve was born in New York on the 25th of September, 1952, the first child of Barbara and Franklin Reeve. My mother was only 20 when I was born, and my father was 24. He was a Russian scholar, uh, a translator, and also a poet, a novelist. He taught first at Columbia, and then at Yale, and at Wesleyan. A year later, a brother, Benjamin, was born. But when Chris was four, his parents divorced, and his mother moved the boys to Princeton, New Jersey. Both parents remarried and had more children. But his parents' divorce was bitter, and Chris spent his childhood being shuttled back and forth between the two households, learning to cope with life in his own serious way. He was earnest. I mean, that word just keeps coming over and over again. Um, and he was always a little bit older. When he was five, he was five going on eight or more. I think that I wanted to be a grown-up to sort of get my childhood past me, uh, to have, you know, real independence, to go out on my own. Always an avid reader, Chris devoured books about his heroes, Harry Houdini and Charles Lindbergh. I think you only need to take Psych 101 to figure out where you're going with that. 
escape and flight, you know. From early on, he found his escape on the stage. At Princeton Day School, he excelled in both academic subjects and sport, but he also took part in plays. Chris was cast as a chorus member in a production of a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta at Princeton's professional theatre, the Makata. The show changed his life. That was a big wow for him. And I, I really think the seeds of wanting to go on the stage uh, go back to when he was nine in that production. The key to unlocking your imagination by being in the theater, that was, that, that was really important in shaping me. The prestigious summer theater in Williamstown, Massachusetts, offered Chris an apprenticeship when he was only 15. But I thought I was 25, you know, I really, you know, I thought I was an adult, you know, and I could, you know, sort of hang in there with the best of them. I think the stage became a neutral ground for him, a place where he could be neither what he thought his mother expected him to be, nor what his father expected him to be. It was a place where he could be himself. After graduating from high school, Chris went to study at Cornell University in upstate New York. I went to Cornell because it gets snowed in from October to May, and you have to study. And you won't be distracted by going down to New York looking for work. So uh, what I did is every spring, I'd go down to New York and audition for a summer job. Summer jobs included working at the San Diego Shakespeare Festival and going on tour. But even during term time, he spent many days away from Cornell. I think it was his sophomore, his junior year, he said, I'd like to go and tour uh, English, French, and English repertory theaters, and I'll write you a paper, and that will, perhaps that could count. By his last year at Cornell, Chris was ready to move on. He applied to the Juilliard School of Music in New York, celebrated for its first-class drama faculty and its rigorous admissions policy. He was one of the advanced students admitted in 1973. Chris was promising not only because he was talented, but he was very tall, very imposing, quite handsome, uh, with a tremendously good voice, and certainly somebody who had presence and clearly had a career ahead of him. That autumn, Chris started at the Juilliard. Chris came in and everybody was just terribly jealous of him, threatened by him. All the girls thought he was gorgeous, which he was. I mean, he looked like he walked right out of Mount Rushmore. Chris and Stanley Wilson became good friends. The friendship soon included another student, Robin Williams. Robin was, you know, from Mars, and I was a hippie from Texas, and we were much more outwardly insane than Chris, but we had a great time because we kind of complimented each other nicely. To pay the fees for his second year at the Juilliard, Chris took a role in a TV soap opera called Love of Life. He played the duplicitous Ben Harper, I guess, a bigamist. I guess you can never forgive me for what I did oh, to ben. you. Ben, and I have. The dialogue, the writing is not always absolutely incredible, <laughs> you know what I mean? So every day is a challenge to try to make it natural and bring it to life and also uh, uh, to make the transition from being on stage to being on camera. His character, Ben Harper, became so popular the producers enlarged the role for him. Soon Chris found he couldn't keep up with all the demands on him. He had to choose between doing the soap opera and making some nice money and getting some camera training or going back for his last year at school. He took the soap. With the income from the soap, Chris was able to pursue another lifelong passion, his love of flying. When I was in my stroller, I would get whiplash from looking at the planes going overhead. I've always been fascinated with flying. After getting his pilot's license at the age of 21, Chris spent many hours flying. He shared his enthusiasm with another friend from the Juilliard. It was very quickly afterwards that we became very good friends, had the same interests. Both of us had a very passionate interest in aviation. Chris's passionate interest in acting was also gaining success. In 1975, even while he was appearing in Love of Life, he won his first theatrical role on Broadway, playing the grandson of Catherine Hepburn in A Matter of Gravity. He almost didn't get beyond the audition. Miss Hepburn and the producer Robert Wrighthead were out in the audience, out in the dark. And I said, uh, Miss Hepburn, before I began, I'm sure my grandmother, Beatrice Lamb, would like to be remembered to you. And of course, you remember that you were classmates at Bryn Mawr, and uh, there was this silence. And then I hear from the auditorium, Oh, B, I never could stand her. 
Whoops. Nevertheless, they hired him on the spot and Chris began to learn a lot about performance from his legendary co-star. The magic of Katharine Hepburn, at least in part, was that she never did the obvious. Um, often she would laugh when you'd expect her to cry and vice versa, look away when you expect her to make contact. And she would change things from performance to performance. And I picked up that habit as well. It was 1976. Christopher Reeve had already made his Broadway debut. In the same year, he went to Hollywood and was given a small part in a submarine disaster movie called Grey Lady Down. Chris later called the film A Disaster About a Disaster. Soon he was back in New York, appearing in an off-Broadway production, My Life. His co-stars were two other young and promising actors. So there was me and Chris and Jeff Daniels in this really tiny dressing room. Chris, he's got very wide shoulders, and he couldn't get in the door if he walked straight. He had to kind of turn his shoulders to get in. While performing in My Life, Christopher Reeve's true destiny was being shaped elsewhere. The film producers Ilya and Alexander Salkind had been planning a big-budget film of Superman for several years. They were looking for the right actor to bring the comic book hero to life. Chris heard about the project from his friends, Stanley Wilson and Michael O'Keefe. Michael wanted to play Jimmy Olsen, and Chris and I both laughed and said, well, you're perfect, you should go get the role, and I wonder who they'll get as Superman, you know. And Chris didn't, he didn't even mention it. I don't think it was even an inkling in him at that point that he might, in fact, play Superman. But Chris's agent got his name on the list of actors being considered for the role. He met the producers, but he didn't take his chances of being chosen too seriously. One day, he had an audition for an underwear commercial and an audition for Superman. And uh, he came home very upset because he didn't get the underwear commercial. It would have been a lot of money. And uh, said, oh, yeah, I auditioned for Superman, and uh, I'll never get that. But to his utter amazement, he did. What happened was this guy, it was Superman walked into the room. He stepped off the page of that comic book. The filmmakers asked Chris to fly to London for a series of screen tests, but he wasn't willing to give up his role in My Life. So he flew to London at the weekends and returned home to New York to perform the play eight times a week. He would come back in and I would help him with his lines. And in between helping him with, with learning the lines and the scenes, I would try to convince him not to do it. <laughs> because, I, you know, I thought, I just didn't think it was the best idea. We were flying one day, and he, he turned to me and he said, uh, you know, I'm up for the part of Superman, this, this, this big adventure film, and, uh, um, and I'm thinking that I'm probably going to get it. I'm thinking of doing it. What do you think about that? And I, I said to him, I think it would probably ruin an actor's career. <laughs> they had him put on the Clark Kent glasses, I found out later, and that got him the part. I mean, he was this guy. So I went from making $75 a week off Broadway to suddenly making quite a lot more of that. For playing the part of Superman, Chris was paid $250,000, a lot of money for a relative unknown. Filming was set to start in London, so Chris left for England on a friend's private plane. And I remember standing on the side of the runway there and crying um, because I just knew that he was going into a different realm and um, he would very soon be earning a lot of money and gaining a lot of attention, and life was going to change for him. The first big change was in his physique. He was skinny back then. He was tall and beautiful, but definitely a string bean. And then off he went to the gym and did, as Chris always does with everything he does, did it 100% and ended up with this gorgeous, gorgeous body. A rising star, Margot Kidder, was cast as Lois Lane, the sidekick of Superman's alter ego, Clark Kent. For the two actors, it wasn't exactly love at first sight. When Chris and I first began working together, we were not enamored of each other. I mean, I was chaos. I was just, I would come charging into scenes, not having planned anything, and I'd go with this and I'd go with that. Christopher would just be horrified at this out-of-control berserko person. 
Over several months, however, his relationship with his volatile co-star began to improve. And then the brother-sister bickering turned into a real brother-sister relationship. We were strapped in those harnesses hanging from that ceiling for months on end, so we got really, really close. And I think that's what made it work on screen. Oh, well, uh, can I uh, take you to the airport? Not unless you can fly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Clark. Hmm? Ladies. Sorry. Change my clothes. Thank you. Well, hey, Lois, maybe we can... Bring... <clears throat> hmm. Um. Uh, Lois? Would you be a pet mail that for me, thanks? Oh, sure. Uh, night. But the long hours on a punishing 18-month shoot were tough for Chris. I think Chris was very lonely in London. Before he left, he would say, you know, I'm still going to be the same old Chris, um, you know, sneakers and dirty blue jeans. Um, and I think when he got to London and everybody was addressing him as Superman and talking about him as Superman, he yearned for someone who knew him as Chris in the sneakers and the dirty blue jeans. The loneliness came to an end one day when Chris was queuing for lunch. There, he met a modeling executive called Gay Exton. Within a few months, they were inseparable. Gay was a very grounding force in his life at that point. Gay Exton, was a, she was a wonderful woman. She was a lot of fun, and they were a great pleasure to be with. And in those days, it was all, you know, it was parties. In 1978, as the opening of Superman approached, Christopher Reeve felt nervous. His future depended entirely on the success of the film. Chris was very apprehensive just before it opened. Why had he done this? And I came across the letter that I wrote to him, you know, reminding him about why he had done it and that it was a good thing you know, and to think about it in those terms. As it turned out, Chris had nothing whatsoever to worry about. When Superman opened in December, it was an instant huge hit. And the critics credited his performance as one of the major reasons for the film's success. First of all, physically, there's a kind of dash, that kind of matinee idol, Errol Flynn quality that you, you never sense that, that this guy was straining to pull off a stunt. He's definitely coming, Mr. Luthor. It's open, come in. In portraying Superman, Chris tried to play down the heroic aspect. He's in a, a different solar system with a yellow sun as opposed to the red sun of Krypton. So that's what gives him his powers. So it's not as though he'd earned them. You know, they just sort of came for free. And uh, that, to me, was the key to playing him with humility, to play him pretty offhand, pretty casual, to play him as a friend rather than a one-man police force. His self-effacing interpretation of Superman's alter ego, Clark Kent, also drew praise. I mean, he really played sort of Cary Grant in Bringing Up Baby as uh, Clark Kent, and it was, a, it was a marvelous performance. On Superman's release, Christopher Reeve became an international superstar overnight. He never skipped a beat. He never, for a second, lost his, his central notion of himself as an actor. I used to live in a fifth floor walk-up and Warner Brothers would start sending limousines and uh, some of my out-of-work actor friends are on this, live on the same block and out of sheer embarrassment I used to ask the limo to wait around the corner and I would sort of come out sneak up the street and get in the limo and drive away. One day an actor friend caught me doing that and says you hypocrite. <laughs> Don't you think we're happy for you? Get in a limousine and drive away and do it for us, okay? And I, I knew that it was okay to go ahead and be famous. But Chris didn't want to be typecast as an all-action hero. He talked to Sean Connery about, uh, about it and asked Sean what he should do, and Sean said you should play every single possible part you can to distance yourself from this. So for his first film after Superman, Chris chose Somewhere in Time, 
a turn-of-the-century romance co-starring Jane Seymour. He had a wonderful time shooting on an island in Lake Michigan, but when the film was released, it proved a complete failure. He was having better luck, though, in his personal life. In December 1979, Chris and Gay had a son, and they named him Matthew. Although Chris was elated with fatherhood, he was in no hurry to get married. For years, I had just been absolutely gun shy. I thought the marriage was, gosh, you know, you sign a piece of paper and then you're locked up forever. It's like, you know, why, why, why shut yourself in? Give me one of the birds, quick! In 1980, Chris returned to Williamstown, Massachusetts, and to the same theater where he had served his apprenticeship. Working at the small summer theater was a considerable change of pace for the international superstar. Here I can disappear into the ensemble, which is getting back to the basics of when I first started to learn to act, and I find that very necessary. I've never met anyone with the, that's as driven and as, as, has as strong a work ethic as he does. You know, and he started then and he just stayed with it. Chris also put his grit and determination to work in other areas. He continued to champion political and social causes. It was a passion that began when he was 15. I remember uh, going door to door on behalf of Bobby Kennedy to sort of get, get people to think about uh, uh, voting for him. And then it went on in 1970. Uh, I remember I joined a, a protest against the invasion of Cambodia. Then when I got to Cornell in the fall of 70, uh, they moved more to environmental issues. Chris was ideally placed to use celebrity to draw attention to social issues. He especially supported such organizations as the Special Olympics. The time when I really found out about Superman was when I met all the participants and the coaches and the athletes of Special Olympics, and I realized that uh, they are the Superman. In 1981, Chris starred in Superman II. He also returned to Broadway in the play 5th of July, playing a Vietnam veteran who was a double amputee. The play received five Tony Award nominations. This success was followed by the film version of Death Trap. Co-starring with Michael Caine, Chris played a psychopath. One of the things about Chris, and I, this may sound counter to the hero thing, but he's a great villain. He was a great villain in Death Trap, you know. I've always believed that an actor should never judge the character that he's playing. That allows you to play somebody evil or somebody with values that aren't the same as yours. And, and it really frees you as an actor. By 1983, 31-year-old Christopher Reeve was firmly established as an international film star. He and Gay also enjoyed another celebration with the birth of their daughter, Alexandra. That summer, Chris took a substantial drop in income to appear with Vanessa Redgrave and Madeleine Potter in the merchant ivory film, The Bostonians. The script was just too good to pass up. What I liked about it is the character I played, Basil Ransom, is morally ambiguous. The audience shouldn't know at the end of the film whether uh, he is a knight in shining armor who rescues a young woman from a, from a very arid kind of life, um, or whether he's an absolute spoiler who is basically a, a chauvinist pig. It's just your sweet nature. I always wanted to please someone, Miss Chancellor, your parents whoever else is dear to you, but it's not really you. You're meant for something different. You're meant for privacy. You're meant for love. For me. The Bostonians was made on a shoestring. Sometimes, uh... Actually, the, they ran short of cash. And when that happened, Ismail Merchant would go in the kitchen and, uh, and uh, whip up a big curry dinner for everybody. And uh, I remember after a while, the crew printed up T-shirts. Uh, they said, I did it for curry. Then art imitated life when Chris was cast in a picture called The Aviator. 
The producers had a nice surprise when they found out that their star was a licensed glider pilot, capable of doing his own aerial sequences. Flying was another good example of the actor's ability to excel in any sport he took up. Chris has always taken whatever sport it is, whether we're playing water volleyball out in Marina del Rey back in the 70s, uh, to, to flying, to sailing, to skiing, he absolutely takes it to the hilt. So he's really testing himself against the elements, if you think about it. At this time, Chris's career path was also being tested. In 1986, he starred in Street Smart as an unscrupulous magazine writer who meets a pimp in the course of his work. The pimp was played by the then unknown Morgan Freeman. When the film was released, it did more for Freeman than it did for Chris. Street Smart was a wildly underrated performance simply because not many people saw that film. Morgan Freeman was up for an Academy Award for it. Street Smart was financed by Canon Films, the company that had bought the rights to Superman on the condition that Chris perform in Superman 4. But when Superman 4 opened in 1987, it failed, striking an unaccustomed blow to his reputation. He suddenly wasn't up on the A-plus list of actors. That's very tough when you've had that much worldwide fame um, to deal with. At the same time, Chris's 10-year relationship with Gay Exton ended. They had never married and the split was amicable. Chris stayed in America, and Gay returned to London with the two children. Chris insisted on joint custody, which is kind of remarkable when you think that there's a whole ocean between them and, uh, and two different cultures. Chris returned to Williamstown in the summer of 1987. Romance was the last thing on his mind, but one evening, as he sat in the audience watching the theater cabaret, one of the performers caught his eye. She was Dana Morosini, and he was intrigued. Not love at first sight, intense fascination and attraction at first sight. It developed very quickly into, into real love. We, we always thought, oh, will, will Chris ever settle down, that kind of thing, you say. And then he met Dana, and suddenly he was another guy. I mean, he was, they were smitten <laughs> with each other. Six months later, they were living together. But soon afterwards, a plea for help put him in the heart of a dangerous political situation in South America. Chile's right-wing dictator, General Augusto Pinochet, had threatened some 70 artists, directors, and performers with execution. And I remember calling up going, Chris, look, I think you can save lives for real this time here. A few days before the deadline for the execution, Chris flew south to Santiago and took part in a demonstration with the protesters. This was an act of salvation for the Chilean artists. Because if Chris had not gone down, I think some of them would have been killed. The international attention on the dictatorship worked, and the death warrants were rescinded. When Chris came back, he was moved, moved in the sense that like an earthquake moves you. He said they had been two or three of the most important days of his life. Chris translated the experience into political action at home in America. In 1989, he formed the Creative Coalition with Ron Silver and Susan Sarandon and a number of other activists. The idea was to uh, um, educate public figures uh, meaning ourselves as well, that we needed to learn the issues in order to be able to communicate effectively with the media um, and, and then to go and speak about the issues. One of their toughest battles was waged in 1990 when Senator Jesse Helms tried to disband the National Endowment for the Arts. The arts are not a luxury. It's not something we indulge ourselves in to make ourselves feel better. It is more than that. It is practical business. It makes sense. We managed uh, to garner enough support and to make ourselves heard and um, we're you know, at least partially credited with saving the NEA from, from going out of business. Chris and Dana then took the big step forward when they married on the 11th of April, 1992. We were having dinner together uh, uh, in our apartment, and remember, right, right during dinner, we just kind of both turned to each other and said, we, we, we need to get married. It's, it's time to get married, you know, and uh, 
Actually, we, we didn't finish dinner. No. Their son, Will, was born two months later. Personal growth continued to inform Chris's work as an actor. His supporting role in The Remains of the Day in 1993 reveals a seasoned actor able to hold his own with such consummate performers as Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins. Former housekeeper, at present living in Clevedon, has indicated to me, sir, that she might be prepared to return to service. What's this, your girlfriend? Or you mean a uh, former attachment? Oh, no, sir, no, sir. No, but very able housekeeper, sir. Most able housekeeper. <clears throat> I, um, I was just kidding, Stevens. Yes, sir? Sorry. Sorry. That was one of the few uh, films where I didn't uh, um, watch with my hands or my eyes. You know, I actually said, no, it's pretty good. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome now one of our two final entries. Here is entry number 103. In the 90s, Chris began to take another of his interests more seriously, competitive horse riding. He had started riding in 1984 and had become a skilled equestrian. It's a sport that rewards patience, perseverance, understanding, you know, rather than a lot of the traditional kind of male sports which are based on aggression and hitting and kind of conquering. On Memorial Day weekend, 1995, Chris went to Culpeper, Virginia to compete in an equestrian event. It was a snap decision made at the last minute. It was a sort of a toss-up between doing that or going to an event up in Vermont or uh, going sailing. But a couple of days before the event, a whole group from the barn where I trained I had decided to go down to Culpeper together, and uh, I was convinced to join, go with everybody. Saturday, the 27th of May, the event began well. However, as Chris galloped towards the third jump, his horse, Buck, suddenly pulled up and he was thrown. And I came straight down on the top rail of the jump, hyperextended my neck and slumped down in a heap. Head first, six feet four inches and 215 pounds of me, straight down on the rail. Within seconds, I was paralyzed and not breathing. Chris was rushed by helicopter to the University of Virginia Medical Center in Charlottesville. There, the doctors fought valiantly to save his life. Mr. Reeve currently has no movement or spontaneous respiration. He may require surgery to stabilize the upper spine in the near future. Chris had broken the first and second vertebrae in his neck, damaging the spinal cord. He was paralyzed and unable to breathe without a respirator. He almost lost hope but Dana had hope enough for two. And then I mouthed my first lucid words to her. Maybe we should let me go. Dana started crying. She said, I'm only gonna say this once. I will support whatever you wanna do because this is your life and your decision. And then she added the words that saved my life. You're still you and I love you. Chris is a man blessed with an extraordinary inner strength He's a fighter and a survivor of the First Order. But this has to be the toughest challenge that he's ever faced. I know it's mine. After 10 days in intensive care, Chris underwent an extremely dangerous operation to reattach his skull to his spinal cord. We're encouraged by the fact that he's moving his right trapezius voluntarily. He also has some movement on the left side. By the end of June, he was out of immediate danger. After a month in hospital, Chris was transferred to the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation in New Jersey. There, he began an intensive exercise program in which he drew on the same determination that had underpinned his acting career. My experience of self-discipline, of resilience, a commitment to doing my absolute best, to really work, working hard, that work ethic that comes with being an actor, um, helped me tremendously in dealing with the prognosis they gave me and in getting me started on exercising and on saying something might happen, let's not give up. There is a, an enormously new focus in Chris, a kind of a, when you sit and talk to him, if you've known him before and you know him now, he is so there 
He's so there that it's quite extraordinary. It's almost uh, intimidating. On the 16th of October, 1995, after more than three months of rehabilitation, Chris made his first public appearance since the accident. He went to New York to attend a fundraising event for the Creative Coalition, at which he was to present an award to his old friend, Robin Williams. Many people were deeply moved by his courage. I think it'll be good to see Chris again. I've seen him uh, in the hospital. I think he's doing really well and very courageous. He had come through the first test. Once back at Kessler, Chris took on another new challenge. To help strengthen his breathing, he increased the amount of time spent off the ventilator. After five and a half months of intensive therapy, in December 1995, Chris was ready to go home and begin the second part of his life. He dedicated it to finding a cure for spinal cord injuries. He was determined to do something about it. What he wanted to know was how. Hello? He said, well, will there be therapies that will restore function to people? I said, yes, if we're lucky, if we work very hard, and we had all the resources that we needed. So he and Dana set up the Christopher Reeve Paralysis Foundation. It's part of my obligation, I believe to help push the public and the private sector to work together to make the funding happen to keep the research scientists doing their job. I don't know of anybody else um, in or out of a wheelchair who works as hard for the cure as Christopher has. Chris began to travel, making speeches and lobbying Congress to obtain greater funding for research. And a tremendous amount of good science that is not being funded and uh, the work is not being done. But it has been discovered that regeneration is possible in the central nervous system, and that's about as big a finding as the invention of the wheel. He believed that with human trials for nerve regeneration just a few years away, he would one day walk again. He began talking about it in public. Then I'll get incremental recovery, breathing. Use my arms and then uh, legs and then eventually up to walking. In the spring of 1996, Chris faced the first anniversary of the accident with optimism. He invited friends round for a party. And we planted a tree out in the backyard and had a little ceremony of hope and affirmation about the future rather than dwelling on the past. There's always going to be turns. We had hopes for how our life was going to go. It didn't go like we planned at all. So we've adjusted. You know, now we're on this road and we have hopes on this road. One of the most powerful cult figures of the past decade. You wonder what kind of human being can actually be like that. One of the most creative people in entertainment. Christian Bell is definitely outside of the norm in, in Hollywood. The master of transformation. People describe Christian Bale as obsessive. He disappears behind the role. The unmasking of the Dark Knight, Christian Bale. Part of an evening of superheroes. Next on Bio. By 1996, Christopher Reeve had spent a year adjusting to his devastating injury. In spite of almost total paralysis, he was eager to get back to work. So he decided to do something he'd never done before, direct a film. For his directorial debut, Chris chose a drama for HBO called In the Gloaming. Starring Glenn Close and Robert Sean Leonard, it tells the story of a family with a son dying of AIDS. It was um, the ideal first directing uh, project for me. It was very um, self-contained. All takes place in one house, one location. And it's really what, what matters is performance. Trying to give the actors the space to, you know, for, for them to spread their wings and fly. Don't tell me you're finally asking me about my sex life. No, no, I'm asking about your love life. Oh, my love life. No, I'm serious. Did you love? Were you loved in return? Yes. Good. 
Chris received an Emmy nomination for his directing. I was very, very proud of how generous everyone was and how everybody pulled together to make it happen, to make it easy. Uh, so I didn't really have to do much except just, just enjoy. Just watch and then say, print. And action. He also did some acting, appearing in a TV movie called A Step Toward Tomorrow and starring in a television remake of Rear Window. Hello. Hello. In 1997, Chris also experienced a change in his own condition. He regained some feeling at the base of his spine. I feel all the way down to my left leg, so that when I got two blood clots in a row, my left leg was excruciating pain. Sometimes pain is good. In 1998, Chris chronicled the story of his spirited fight back in an autobiography, Still Me which is, I think, a wonderful title. And I think this was the most important effect of Christopher on people, that they treat people with spinal cord injury as people, as still them. To help those people suffering from paralysis, Chris and his wife opened the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Resource Center in New Jersey. It provides information on everything from travel to the latest medical research findings whether it happened yesterday or 20 years ago. And you can go online to paralysis.org and uh, information specialists will help you. And uh, I'm very proud of that because when I was injured, we had nowhere to turn. In November 2000, Chris experienced another sign of progress. And I was sitting in my office with Dana and my index finger, my left index finger, began to move. And she said, are you doing that on purpose? And I said, no. And she said, well, try. And, and so I looked at it, and I did. And I tried, and I found, yeah, I could move it. And so I figured, if that can happen, well, who knows what else can happen? Let's go find out. True to form, Christopher Reeve used his hard-won progress to take on even more work. He appeared in the TV show Smallville and directed a number of projects, including The Brooke Ellison Story an A&E original film about a young woman's brave struggle against paralysis. The story, I think, will reach and impact more people than me giving 55 speeches. So I felt that both as, as a disabled person uh, and as a filmmaker that it would be the right thing to do to tell this, this story. He's really good, and then, you know, couple that with the situation he's in, and then he becomes amazing. He becomes, in fact, Superman. But what we hope you can learn from us, and from each other, is to take no one in your life for granted. Given the parallels between our lives, he's very sensitive about what needs to be demonstrated in a situation like my own. It feels important to me to try to make a contribution to raising awareness about spinal cord injury. I mean, just in very simple terms, for example, most people don't have any idea what it takes to end up sitting in a wheelchair in the morning, particularly when you have a severe injury and you're uh, completely dependent on other people to do everything for you. After the film was finished in July 2004, Chris continued to use his star power to raise public awareness about the issues facing paralytics in everyday life. And he campaigned hard to lift a presidential ban on stem cell research. Unfortunately, he would not live long enough to enjoy the results of his crusade. Family, friends and fans are mourning Christopher Reeve, the actor and medical research activist. Reeve died yesterday of complications from an infection at a hospital north of New York City. He was 52. Chris suffered a heart attack after developing an infection from a pressure wound, which is a common complication for people living with paralysis. His sudden death on the 10th of October 2004 is undeniably a loss, but he leaves behind a legacy of hope for millions of people. He worked tirelessly throughout the last nine years of his life, not only on his own progress, but for the causes that, without his stalwart efforts, might never have received the attention they deserved. An advocate for advancement and a catalyst for change, he became an international symbol of courage. 
And while he acted the part of a superhero on the silver screen, Christopher Reeve proved to us all that you can be an even bigger hero in real life. Our next superhero was born in Wales, raised in Portugal, and lives in the USA. He also adores the WWF, but which one? In a Biography Channel premiere, stand by for the story of Christian Bale.